Praise the Lord. Hello, folks. Once again, we are live on uh, this program. I'm your host. My name is Muhammad Faridi. This show is called Forsaking My Father's Religion because that's what we have done. And we're, go we're going to go bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, our, lo our Lord and Savior. Today, I have a very, very special guest. Her name is Nagme. Nagme is an Iranian former Muslim just like me, but she came to faith and we're going to hear from her, her testimony, her story of forsaking her father, father's religion. Nagme, welcome on this show. Thank you for being here. Please introduce yourself and uh, uh, tell us a little more about yourself. Uh, well, my name is Nagme. A lot of people know me as Nagme here. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in Iran. My full last name is Shariat Panahi. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, growing up, my dad always uh, prided himself that our last name means we were related to the Prophet Muhammad. Wow. And uh, when we became citizens, we took away the Shariat and just became Panahi. Shariat so, means the, um, the, Islamic. the law, the Islamic law. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's like protector of the Islamic law. Wow. <laughs> That's, that was our last name. And I think, you know, my uncle, my uncle kept the Shariat and we kept the Panahi. Correct. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, grew up in a very strong, my dad wanted the Islamic government to happen. So, mm -hmm. uh, I was born 1977. Islamic Revolution happened 1979. Wow. Oh. My mom was in the King's Army. She was one of the first women to be in the King's Army. And uh, so when the revolution happened, she was uh, arresting protesters. Mm -hmm. and, my, and, my, and my dad was one of the protesters. So um, wow. my dad really wanted the Islamic government. He was a very strong Muslim. Mm -hmm. he, prided our, uh, he prided in our last name being our blood being related to the prophet. Mm -hmm. He he thought Islam would solve all the problems Iran had, as you know, in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, people like my mom, they wore short skirts, tank tops. They mm -hmm. looked like Europe, you know. And um, my dad just saw a lot of Western influence in Iran. He thought, you know, with Islam becoming a new, uh, Iran becoming an Islamic government, following the law of Islam, it would take a lot of the corruption out of the culture and also um, also that it would help with a lot of the economic issues. Mm -hmm. So, so brings equal, to bring equality to our country, but uh, through the Islamic youth, utopia, is that correct? Yes, he thought, so, it, mm -hmm. he thought through Islam um, that uh, there could be uh, equality in the economy, the poor would do better. Um, and like you said, uh, some sort of a utopia. And so he really thought Islam would solve everything. So he was very yeah. crucial in trying to get the Islamic government to, for and the revolution. The Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, Nagme, you remember uh, his famous speech was about giving uh, electricity and mm -hmm. bring the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the petroleum money to the Iranian table and uh, free transportation, uh, free um, um, media is going to give us a beautiful <laughs> Islamic um, utopia Talk that is going to uh, bring uh, excellency, equality to our uh, country. We're going to get it from the rich, which was uh, the king and his family, and give it to the poor, and everybody is going to be very, very happy. And that was the propaganda before the revolution. And of course, with the help of um, the French and the British left, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini got in power, came to Iran and took, we had a, a Islamic rev revolution. And um, people were glad that this is happening. And right after that, of course, we uh, reaped the 45 years of the result of it still today, uh, what, what they brought to our country. Uh, to our country. As an Islamic yes. government, so mm -hmm. um, so your dad was for it. How about your yes. mom? My mom was not as she considered herself Muslim, but mm -hmm. she was more of a moderate Muslim, and mm -hmm. she did not agree with that. So in our family, there was uh, I mean, my dad really respected my mom and really prided that his wife was in the army and knew mm -hmm. how to shoot and karate and mm -hmm. all of that. But um, they, there was there was discussions because my mom was very hesitant and mm -hmm. kind of a little bit afraid of what that Islamic um, revolution would look like. Of course, she was uh, 
she had sworn uh, loyalty to the king. Of course, yes. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. part of her uh, was that to protect the, uh, protect the king and stop the revolution from happening. But uh, my mom was not as sure about what, she was actually very hesitant about mm -hmm. what is the Islamic government would look like. Mm -hmm. And um, I think she was right. She was a, a little bit afraid of what it would mean for women and mm -hmm. their freedom. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so there was discussions in our house. My dad really thought, as you said, that Ayatollah Khomeini promised um, to distribute the wealth using the oil money, which now mm -hmm. they use for terrorism. <laughs> yep. But they promised a lot of good things and the people believed it. And it was a lot of young people. Uh, my dad was, was it, in his 20s. My parents mm -hmm. were in their 20s and it was the college age that were brainwashed and mm -hmm. believed it. And so a lot of the young people, like my parents really, I mean, my dad really wanted it to happen. When So when the Islamic government did happen, my dad actually was uh, offered a high position with the government, I think like Minister of Communication or something. Wow. Wow. Um, but wow. he, he didn't accept it because he saw soon after the revolution, they started just by gossip. If they heard something about someone, they would just kill them. Yeah. And so he was he was afraid of getting a position and then being killed because there was mm -hmm. just such a battle to the top and people would like backstab each other and backbiting. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't accept that position, but he was honored so much by the government um, and, um, you know, respected as a strong Muslim. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But, so he, he was a practicing Muslim, but she wasn't as uh, as much of as much involved. Correct. Yeah, my dad was a practicing Muslim. He would we would see him pray. We would see him, um, you know, he was not much a Moscow, but he would pray. He would fast. Mm -hmm. My mom, you know, since she was a little girl, she would say she she lost her dad early on when she was five. But her older brother tried to make her wear the head covering. She mm -hmm. always resisted any. Uh, she was kind of a more of a like fighting for women's issues as a Muslim, you know? Mm -hmm. And so she always resisted the head covering. She wouldn't mm -hmm. allow her older brother to force that on her. So uh, my mom was more of a moderate Muslim and kind of, I guess, <clears throat> didn't really pray as much. She kind of mm -hmm. considered herself Muslim, but not really, I would say she wasn't really a practicing Muslim, but she mm -hmm. also prided herself in being Muslim. Both my parents came from uh, you know, uh, we say Shia, uh, we say say the Tabo Tabais, which is both um, both sides of my parents were related to the Prophet, so they prided. They, they had the blood of the uh, the the Prophet of Islam. Yeah, they both could trace them. it down all the way 14th century to say that we're related. That's why they were Sayyid, correct? Yes, and I heard uh, from my mom recently that also people would tie their money to say it's like a fifth of their oh, money. Oh, I did not and know that. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of land and money and power because people would respect them. You know, mm -hmm. as as you know, the Shia religion really or sect of Islam really, uh, you know, they believe after Muhammad, a relative took, you know, takes Correct. over. And so they really care about bloodline. Of and course, so yes. from, from my understanding, even the Shias were so respected that uh, uh, the Sayyids being the bloodline of the Prophet, that the people would give alms or tithes to them, and they were actually really Amazing. rich. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, how was your childhood growing up in, in, in the midst of all that? So, I grew up in the revolution. My mom would be out in the streets mm -hmm. trying to stop the protests. We didn't know when she would. We, I had a nanny, and she would mm -hmm. always be crying because either she was crying over my mom, not knowing if, you know, as as you know, there was the Mujahideen, there was so many different people trying to get to power mm -hmm. and there was so many people being killed. So she was afraid for my mom being killed as as the as 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 an as an officer in the army trying to stop the revolution. She was afraid for my dad because mm -hmm. he was protesting and there was just so much chaos. People were just being killed in the street, just gone down. And she didn't. She would always be worried whether we we um, not have any parent. Like both of our parents would be killed. So that was very chaotic with the revolution. And then, as you know, a year after the revolution, the war with Iraq started, and of course, yeah, that was mm -hmm. pretty devastating. And I think that's when my dad. I mean, soon after the revolution, my dad realized, oh, oh, this is not good. Mm -hmm. um, How many people are, are in your, your dad's place that? soon after quickly they realized 
What a mistake. What a tragic mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was too late. They were, they were brutal. Yeah. And, and my dad actually experienced personally how brutal they were. They arrested, the Iranian government arrested uh, my uncle when he was 13 or 14. He, was, he hadn't even hit puberty yet. He was a little boy. And um, they put him in prison. Uh, I think he was in one of the opposition groups of the government. And they put him in prison. And when he turned 18, they called my grandma and said, uh, your, uh, your son has been set free. You can come get him. She went there excited, but they had killed him and handed him, handed her his belongings. And so uh, my dad was devastated. He's the oldest son. He felt like he could have protected my uncle, maybe found a way to get him out of prison. They just didn't think the Islamic government was going to do that. Yes. Wow. Um, wow. And then my brother, when the war happened with Iraq, uh, as you know, a lot of the, uh, the uh, Islamic uh revolutionary guards would mm -hmm. go into schools and they would tell little boys to sign up to go to war and die yep. mm -hmm. in war uh, they would run through mines mm -hmm. and and so my brother was about to sign up to uh go through the mines and my parents couldn't stop him parents mm -hmm. couldn't didn't have a say so my dad realized oh no i've lost my brother to this government now i'm gonna lose my son and that's when my dad decided to just leave he he realized within a few years after the revolution that he had make it, made a big mistake and uh and of course my mom paid a heavy price uh, she a lot of her colleagues um who were with the in the king's army were killed she because she didn't have as much of a higher rank i think she was a colonel she they didn't uh kill her but they took away her her uh, ranks they took away her guns. They made her work in the office, and she was lucky that they didn't kill her. Yes, for but sure. But she lost all of her rights as a woman, and so they both saw quickly how bad the Islamic Revolution was. And so that's when we came to America when I was nine years old. Wow! Wow! So how long did they did you guys stay in Iran, and then uh, when did you move? Like. Well, uh, Islamic Revolution happened in 1979, so I, from the time I was two until nine for seven years, mm -hmm. and six years of the war, the first year of the revolution, then six years, it was an eight-year war, so two years before the war was over, we came to America. I was nine years old at that time. Wow. Now, I, I'm, I'm born in 84, and um, when, we, when, when, when we were born, uh, it was all the bombings and the rockets mm -hmm. and all the... Um, um and iraqi jets going over the cities and bombing them yes and, uh, we had taped all over our um window and doors yes. and stuff like that yes and, uh, so they wouldn't break you yeah, would hear you would hear the sirens you would go constantly into the basement. constantly yes and then we so, were called the generation of war um mm. or um nasla jang well, wow. uh, uh, you were what? What generation were you? We have general, I mean, we have here millennials and Gen Zs and this and that, boomers, but in Iran, we had a different kind. I, my generation was war generation because we were born in the middle of chaos. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, uh, your family and you left Iran and you came to America when you were nine years old, correct? Yeah, that would be two years after you were born. So uh you were you were born 86 84 oh 84 okay so mm. we were we came to america yeah 86 yes so wow. two years after you were born so you were uh, four years of your life was the war the first four years yep exactly yeah because i think it ended in 88 it so mm -hmm. yeah because when we came to america it, it kept getting worse uh, if you remember i my dad was in the medical field mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. equipment I mean, he would t t tell us about how now there was a chemical warfare, how bad it was getting. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. so we left as it was getting really bad. Um, mm -hmm. But I know in the 87, 88, it got even worse with the chemical stuff. But we left in 86. Wow, wow. And then you came to America and uh, tell us what has happened since. Yeah, uh, we had a little, well, you know, you know, having been raised in war generation of the war you you're you don't really have much of a childhood i remember mm -hmm. uh, me and my twin brother nima we would uh we didn't really you can't really have much of a childhood we talked a lot about war and why mm -hmm. god a lot of questions about god mm -hmm. uh why was god doing this we tried to do the islamic prayer uh, we started fasting with my dad 
And uh, so we had a lot of questions about God that we, we would, as twins, we would talk about as we would hear the bombs dropping, mm -hmm. as you said, with the airplanes, we would mm -hmm. in the basement. And soon after we came, my brother came running to me and crying. And he said, Nagme, we found the, I found the God we've been looking for. His name is Jesus. And uh, having been raised in a strong Shia Muslim family, mm -hmm. uh, Islamic revolution, war, you don't really hear anything about Jesus at all. Of course, or whatever you hear is misrepresentation of who Jesus is truly. So, you know, they tell you, oh, Hazrat Isa, the, the, the prophet, prophet Isa, or the prophet uh, Jesus, and um, that's about it. And then there is a day that he was born, and there was no day of death because it was taken up, and that's about it. So that's the yeah. extent of our knowledge. And then Christianity to us was Catholicism, it was uh, the movies. The people mm -hmm. that they light up candles that's how much we knew about christian that's how much i knew yeah about i didn't i didn't even know that i you know i didn't wow. even know i didn't even mm -hmm. know that it was so chaotic when i was born with the revolution and then mm -hmm. the war we didn't even have that time of uh, discussion about jesus it was all about the war with iraq going into war and mm -hmm. islam and so I hadn't, I hadn't even later when I went back mm -hmm. to Iran in my twenties, I heard about you know Muslims talking about Jesus as a prophet and all of that. But um, when I was, you know, when I was uh, um, raised up in Iran, I didn't hear about it. So when my brother said, "I found the God we've been looking for. His name is mm -hmm. Jesus," I was like, "What? Who?" <laughs> And he said, you know, I had a vision. He said he was crying. So my brother, my twin brother is very uh, um, mathematical. Uh -huh. he, en he ended up getting his doctorate in quantum <laughs> physics at University of Chicago. Wow. So uh -huh. he aced his way through college, was called a genius, all math. So I didn't see much emotion from him. Uh -huh. To this day, I, I've barely ever seen him shed a tear. Uh -huh. I think that uh, outside of when he cried to me and said, I found the God we've been looking for, the, the other time I've seen him shed a tear was when my, our dad passed away. But um, I haven't really seen him emotional. So when he came to me emotional, I was like, what? Like, what is this? He was, he's, again, he's not an emotional person if you meet him. He's very uh, logical. Mm -hmm. And so for him to be emotional over what he said he had a vision was very shocking to me. And so I said, what happened? And he said, I, I saw a vision, God, because we would question like, because in Islam, as you know, there's like, God is like out to get you, like vengeance, if you've done something mm -hmm. wrong, the right angel and the left angel count how many good and bad you've done. So we would be like- Actually, right and left genies, not genies. angels, yeah. Mm -hmm. Genies, which is what? Which is like Gen. demons? Yeah, yeah. De demons. <laughs> yep. They're writing yeah. every move of you, and of course, they're going to report to Allah, and Allah is going to punish for every little things you have done. Yes. And um, that, that bridge is so narrow that uh, when you walk on it, you're walking on the edge of a blade, and you will fall over, and Allah is yes. as this uh, lake yes. of fire or hell. Yes. That, uh, he and, it's, mm -hmm. and it's all based on works. So we wondered if God was just taking out his vengeance on because we did something wrong. So when right. he had the vision, he all he felt was love. And he said, no, that's not who God is. God is love. He loves us. Wow. He cares for us. And so he was crying. And for me, you know, I didn't have a vision. But my brother, again, who's mathematical, who got ended up getting his doctorate in quantum physics, when he cried, I was so moved. I knew he had encountered God. He'd seen something. Wow. And mm -hmm. so we were in a townhouse. We were living with my uncle at that time, but had not heard anything um, about, about Jesus. But we were asking the people in our townhouse, uh, with the swimming pool in the middle, which we ended mm -hmm. up getting baptized and who's Jesus, tell us about Jesus. And we were finally told, my dad was traveling, my mom was out shopping. We were finally told, this is who Jesus is. You can follow him. And my brother was like, yes, 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 I wanna follow him. And and then they told mm -hmm. him about us, about baptism and said, I wanna be baptized right now, right now. He was just excited. Mm -hmm. He So I kind of followed along with him. I um, just because of the way he was affected my journey my journey in following christ was a little bit different how old was he when he had that encounter nine we were nine we were oh, twins wow oh wow okay 
so he just jumped in. I was a little bit like, okay, like something has definitely happened. Mm -hmm. I've never seen my twin brother like this. So I followed along. I said the sinner's prayer. I got baptized, mm -hmm. but my journey was a little, um, little bit different. He was, he's been all in since nine. I mean, to this day, he's like, praise God. And, but, and, you know, um, but for me, it just was slowly, you know, uh, seeking God, praying, and just the more I, I walk with God, the more I saw his, mm -hmm. his uh, my relationship grow. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, soon after we were saved, we were actually given a, a Psalm New Testament. Mm -hmm. So just the book of Psalm and New Testament, so we start reading it immediately. And I got to Psalm 2 where it says, you know, today I've begotten you, ask of me and I will give you the nations. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my mom came home and she took it away. So all I remembered from the Bible was Psalm 2. And that's a, the prayer I prayed growing up was, you know, God, you know, today you've begotten me. I know it talks about Jesus, but I took it for myself, <laughs> you know, and I am asking you for the nations, you know, uh, I pray that you would give me the nations as my inheritance. I really wanted to see the Middle East Muslim world come to know Jesus, but especially my heart was with Iran. And as you know, in the mm -hmm. 80s, it was pretty Islamic militant. 90s, we start seeing martyrs coming out of Iran, Brother Haik, Brother Dibaj, Brother Sudman, uh, late 90s. And then two, early 2000, we had the um, early 2000, we had that uh, revival happen. And so I didn't know that God was about to send me, you know, after college, he sent me into Iran right at the verge of a revival. Wow. wow. So, yeah, so um, I prayed for the nations until from nine until 16. My parents were pretty brutal in trying to convert us back to Islam. My dad mm -hmm. had many talks with us. He said, you're so young. You've been brainwashed by Americans, by America, and mm -hmm. um, my mom was ups also very upset. My mom, uh, my mom's anger was a little different. Why she was angry? Mm -hmm. She was saying that you are worshiping an idol. You've made a prophet God, and so she said, you know, uh, because even as a Muslim, a moderate Muslim, she really resisted the Shia belief of praying to the different imams. Mm -hmm. she, she would say, I'm just going to pray to God. Why do I need to go to different prophets? Correct. And so for her, her anger towards us was that she was saying, you are praying, you are saying Jesus is God, you're blaspheming, you're, so her anger was like, we'd made a prophet God and we were blaspheming. My dad's mm -hmm. was, you know, was definitely more than that, more related to, you know, we were from the prophet, you can't convert, this is not an option. And so they were both very angry with us. I didn't know when I turned 16, I could drive. I started sneaking out to go to church. Um, I didn't know that my parents knew I was going to church, but they weren't doing anything about it mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't know at 16, they had started reading the Bible that they had taken away from me. And uh, so wow. God, God was changing their heart when I was 16. I didn't know that. My mom was going through a depression. She had started reading the Bible. My dad had noticed change in her and asked her what's going on. She gave him the Bible. And so uh, they were both reading the Bible. So at 16, I noticed they weren't as angry towards our faith, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what was happening uh, mm -hmm. until after college, when me and my brother came home at 22, my parents said, uh, we're safe. We want to follow Jesus. We want to be baptized. Let's go find a church. But growing uh, at 16, they, I, we didn't really know. Mm -hmm. But when we came out of college is when they were both very excited That's and on awesome. fire. Wow. Yeah. That's great. So the Bible that they took away from you to stop you from reading it, they actually were reading it themselves. Yes. And yes. the Sever word of God. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Several years later, not, not mm -hmm. at that time, but about six years later, seven years later, they start reading it. Wow. Who was the first believer out of the family? uh out of out, out, out of uh, your family your yes so me and my brother were the first and then it was um my mom and dad i would say probably my mom first mm -hmm. uh and then my dad my little sister who was five years younger she said she was she said she, she told us she was saved too when me and my brother were saved but she said i was afraid to say anything because i saw what my parents did and she said i oh, saw what wow. our parents did to you so my sister uh, also confessed the same time my parents did but she i according to her she had been she'd been a believe secret believer and uh, afraid to tell my parents but 
And then soon after my dad was saved, my grandma who was 85 got saved. Mm -hmm. Um, we had aunts, uncles, cousins, uh, my dad's side of the family, pretty much everyone got saved. My mom's side, we had a handful of cousins and uncles that got saved one uncle and a few cousins, but my dad's side of the family, pretty much everyone was saved. And, um, so and that is that that seed was started with the vision or with the dream that your brother Nima had when he was nine, right? Yes. That is an absolutely amazing story. And then Nima and then Nagme and then this grow to almost everyone in the side of your uh, father's side. And then, of course, members of your family. Wow. I don't know if it's not called revival what it is. <laughs> well, my, my dad and mom, after they got saved, they took Bibles into Iran and God miraculously saved them from a possible uh, arrest, but they were able to smuggle Bibles in and my dad just started sharing and giving Bibles to his family and my mom to her family. And uh, we had family members that later said, you know, you gave us, you know, as you know, probably in Islam, people are afraid to touch holy books. So my parents, for example, they took away our Bible, but they were afraid to like, burn it or throw it away <laughs> There's, there was a little bit of a fear of not doing anything with it so we would also hear the same with family members was that they would get the bible and just throw it like put it aside but then it, when they were going through like um tra like depression or suicidal mm -hmm. thoughts they would grab it and then they would start reading it and then god would change their heart and they would become believers so those bibles that went into our family's homes in iran they you know a lot of people came back saved and um and that was my parents were both just excited to evangelize and tell everyone about about you know their faith so yeah. um that happened and then uh after college i really uh, about two months after september 11 <clears throat> i felt like god was telling me to go to iran it sounded mm -hmm. crazy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, i don't know where you were at september 11 most people remember where they were it was pretty uh, crazy what, what happened here. And there was a lot of fear of getting into airplanes. And and um, my parents thought I was crazy getting onto an airplane and going back to Iran. <clears throat> and so, but God sent me at a verge of a revival. As you remember, late 90s, there was a lot of martyrs. So the blood of the right. martyr yeah. is the seed of the church. 1995 and 1996, that's when uh, um, Pike, the Pike uh, and Dibaj Islamic and Revolutionary realize that these um, pastors these bishops these uh, believers are not uh quieting they're not they can't silence them so yes. they start taking them out in a uh, very brutal way and uh we had six uh pastors that they were killed back to back and then oh in a horrible way like you said um, one of them sued man i think in mashad was hung from a like a tree a, a tree that they in were one like, of their homes yeah yeah, public yeah. display of killing these pastors. And the reason a lot of them were killed was, or Dibaj, like Brother Hike was defending Dibaj, was also a lot of the Armenian pastors were supposed to not allow uh, Muslims into their churches. They were just supposed to speak only in Armenian and not evangelize, but Muslims were coming into these uh, government sanctioned building churches. And uh, Brother Hike, you know, uh, there was people like Brother Hike who stood up for that and uh, were martyred mm -hmm. as a result. So like yes. you said, they were standing up to the government and saying, there is no religious freedom, you're killing Muslim converts. And unfortunately, Brother Haik and Brother Dibaj lost their lives. So we had a, Iran had a lot of martyrs in the mid to late 90s. But revival started in the early 2000s, as you know. Correct. I'm actually uh, part of that uh, early 2000 revival, uh, Nagme. Oh. Yep. I, Were you uh, there? Were you in Iran? Yes, ma'am. Um, I was um, in uh, 2006. I heard the gospel. Uh, I was just uh, served the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard of Iran. And, um, you know, it's mandatory. So I served my service. Yes. And um, I remember that um, um, I come from a Shaheed, a martyr family. My uncle, wow. of my uh, cousins died in, in the war with Iraq. Uh, one of them actually... Um, was I think 18 or 19 years old. So mm. we were very um, elevated in the community, you know, the people respected us. Oh, Khanavade uh, Shahid, they're very important oh, yes. people. Yes. And then uh, um, the, uh, my, my uncle's mural was uh, painted in, on, uh, on the uh, major mosque in uh, the city that the, he was uh, born and raised. And um, 
Wow. We had the uh, streets to our uh, two streets to our last names. My mom's side of uh, uh, family and then that side of the family. We had streets to our name because of Shahid Faridi, Shahid this, Shahid that. So, wow. uh, so that was my upbringing. And then wow. of course, after the Revolutionary Guard um, in 2006, through my service, uh, mandatory service, um, I came out. Um, you know, purpose was a big thing for me. And I was thinking Allah is giving me purpose, you know, mm -hmm. with these things and... Uh, but a friend of mine uh, by the name Rasul, um, he Rasul was uh, medically exempt from the military service, and um, he came out and then shared the gospel with me while I was being trained by the Revolutionary Guard of Iran, Masipa. He wow. actually converted to Christianity through who? That's the I want, I want to connect the dots to the story you're telling about these pastors not bowing down to the Islamic regime, to the uh, to the Molak. It is the. Um, uh, Rasul's aunt was sitting in a taxi in Tehran, which the, ta the taxi driver was an Armenian pastor, shared the gospel mm -hmm. with Rasul's aunt, Rasul's aunt shared with Rasul, and then, of course, with me, and then we all were getting self through that, so we had some relationship with the Armenian church. Thank God for those pastors that mm -hmm. they didn't bow down, they didn't keep quiet, and they shared the gospel, and as a result, God knows how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of Iranians have been saved. That was the first part of the, I believe, the uh, revolution mm -hmm. in 2004, 5, and 6. Many believers, I have another believer in our home. His name is Siava. She was saved in 2005. Uh, Were you guys uh, in Tehran? Did you guys go to Central Church in Tehran? We did. We did. Assemblies of God, of course. And then. Uh, so so yeah. I, we were there at the same time. Are you serious? Well, no, wow. you know what? No, no. I left end of I I went to Iran uh, end of two thousand one. I left end of two thousand five. You were, but I was at the Central Assembly. Yes. Um, until two thousand five, I would visit. I knew well, all the pastors, uh, Surik and Vartan, yeah. and Pastor all of Surik them. was um, the when when I went to visit the church, he was um, um, of course the lead pastor, and then his yes. daughter. Um, yes, she's a, she has a beautiful voice. My goodness, what's her name? Yes. Um, uh, anyway, so she she led the worship, and I mean, the church was wall yes. to wall. I mean, in the hallways, everywhere, in the balcony, people were standing, Muslims getting saved. I yes. mean, it was an amazing. You know, that's where me and Said had our wedding in two thousand four. Wow. We had we had it inside of that church. It was packed with people. And we were passing out Bibles in Jesus film. Surik and Vartan were there at the wedding. And um, we were passing out as uh, wedding favors. We were passing out Jesus film and um, Bibles. And the Iranian government actually approved us Muslim born to have a Christian wedding, which was a miracle. But yes, that church was very, that church uh, had a lot of martyrs. Unfortunately, it's closed today, but. Yes. Look, um, Nagma Siavash is saying that He's, he was part of your church in Turkey. Oh, and he yeah. Lived with us. yeah. <laughs> that, is that is amazing. Yes, we, we um, when uh, the house church movement started, so Said was part of the underground Bible school that the Central Assembly started because as the government was killing the pastors in the late 90s, uh, the, the, they decided to go underground. So they started mm -hmm. training people and uh, by the time the government started shutting down buildings, the church had already gone underground. So when I met Said, we, uh, I had about five people from my family had become Christian. He had a few dozen and we did, we were working in the underground house churches. And within two years uh, from 2002 until 2004, uh, we were, we had uh, over 2000 believers in 33 cities, we had house churches. So uh, our house church network was definitely one of the largest and a lot of um, there was there was a like as uh, your friend Siavash says there was just a lot of people that we got to and he uh, mentioned another name by Fawad. Yes, that's my cousin. Wow, that is awesome. <laughs> Fawad is my cousin. He's in America right now. So my cousin Fawad was one of the main house church leaders. Yes. Wow. Well, yes. that's awesome. <laughs> Yep. So it just uh, actually Fawad was my first convert, <laughs> first person <laughs> I led to the Lord. Uh, it was very difficult because 
I shared the gospel with him. We were going through the book of John. Mm -hmm. Then he became a, uh, my cousin, Fouad, who ended up being one of the main pastors of the underground church. Then after I shared the gospel with him, he became a stronger Muslim. He started going to the mosque. Of course, he started yes. praying more. He started reading the Quran more. And I was so devastated. I said, God, I was, I was sharing with him. He, I, I think what happened was he was hearing about Christianity and he thought, well, I don't even know my own religion. I need to practice my own religion to even compare. And so actually going deeper into Islam is what mm -hmm. brought him into Christianity. Correct. And this, uh, now, I mean, you know, this happens to a lot of Muslims, you know, when, um, uh, we go in and share the gospel with them, share Christianity, what Christianity is. And then they come up with some um, general ideas about Islam that, well, Islam is a religion of peace or Islam is beautiful too. Some bad apples are out there uh, giving a bad face. But when we speak to them about Islam, what Islam is actually is, what the Quran actually says, we show them, I mean, they're totally shocked. Mm, Those yes. Muslims are they are totally shocked with the reality of what Islam is. Yes. So they have two options. We, we always see that there's two options. Go and find out for yourself mm. because now you have identity crisis. You have to go and see yes. is this is this crazy convert yes. is this mortad this apostate yes. telling me the truth this religion is this bad so as a result they go practice islam and get dive deeper in it and that's a really good point actually because they start reading the quran looking in the life of muhammad not me the self-claimed prophet of islam and then they realize it's not what they think it is exactly so they separate from it and, and that distance of course happens really beautifully and um, god is using it to um yes um, bring it more to christianity yeah, I even had one aunt, my one of my dad's sisters who did the same. She became stronger in Islam. She went to Mecca, the pilgrimage. She came back from Mecca and she became a believer. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you are so discouraged. You think, I just shared the gospel with this person. Why are they becoming stronger in Islam? Mm -hmm. But some people have to go through that journey of, uh, like you said, an identity crisis. Mm -hmm. And they go, they say, well, I got to know my religion because a lot of them are more um, moderate, they haven't really studied the Quran, they mm -hmm. haven't really know much, they just know they're Muslim. So when they actually go deep into it, then they actually get saved because they yeah. realize what it is. Um, this is what yeah. I say now, man. I believe with all of my heart. If Muslims really read the Quran, just read it in their language, whatever language it is, they just read it, they, they could come to the conclusion that this is not God. Yes. This is not from heaven. This is not that mm. as holy as they think it is mm -hmm. because they believe that this is a divine, I mean, totally word of Allah that came from heaven down and it's kept in that book. So uh, mm. a statistic shows that 87% of the Muslim world do not speak Arabic. Therefore, they cannot understand. Persians wow. don't. Persians Afghans don't. don't. I mean, the American Muslim, I mean, you name it, the people that they cannot read or understand Arabic, they cannot read the Quran, so they don't know what it says. But when they read it, that like the Turks, you name them, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, India, Philippines, Indonesia, you name them. If that person reads this thing once for themselves, in, instead of believing what the Mullah said in the, in the mosque or the Sheikh or the Imam in the mosque says, if they read it for themselves, I believe with all of my heart, as we are seeing it now, because of in the time that we live in, we have access to so much information. Imagine when we grow up, there was one Quran on the highest place in our home. Mm, yes. You have to do uh, ablution. You have to wash yourself seven times or whatever to touch the book. So it's it's Satan has made it so difficult that you never read it. It's in a different language. You have to uh, do a, a ceremonial washing to touch it, and you feel so unholy about t touching this book. So you ne you will never touch it. Therefore, it will stay in that high place mm. as this authoritative uh, authoritative author authoritative. I can't say the word authoritative book. That will you just believe whatever whoever says that they have the the, the respect or the rights to touch it. But when Muslims read it, 
they realize, my God, this is so much contradiction, so much mumbo jumbo. You can't even understand. <laughs> yes, it's hard to understand. And I, and I tried to read it in English, and it was hard to understand. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to read it in any no, language. They tell you you're not supposed to. Hmm. And then you, you jump from one story to another. You just like it's just so. Uh, it's just a mumble jumble. You can't understand. It's not um, coherent. That's the word I was not. looking for. You can't understand the thing. So yes. they read it and they say, this is the word of God. What kind of God is this that you cannot communicate correctly to us? And as a result, they become distant. They become, yes. they understand. But the gap that uh, creates in this or, or, or comes uh, forth, now what is their answer? If, not, if it's not Islam, to you, for your whole life you have been told, Islam is the best, Islam the most complete. And if the most complete is like this, how about the lesser religion such as Christianity or the exactly. other Exactly, which, so, which is what they say, is Islam is the most complete and it, Christianity is, has been, you know. Altered, it's, it's corrupted, lesser. whatever. And um, Jesus, unfortunately, according to the Muslim, failed his mission. So Allah had to send another one to complete what Jesus failed. <laughs> which Jesus says it is finished. He actually, uh, I, and I think, you know, I mean, I, I'm not as well versed w as you are with the Islamic religion. I was very young, but mm -hmm. you know, there's two types of writing. I mean, there's the peaceful writing that was written when Islam was weak. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the Mecca writing maybe. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's the, when Islam was stronger, then you have the, where they question Christianity, they question the Bible as being mm -hmm. like, so you kind of see two, so many contradictions in one area, you see, you know, the Christians and Jews are your brothers, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the Torah and the NGL are God's words. And then in other, you say, no, and, you know, kill them wherever you find the Jews and the Christians and their book is, you know, mm -hmm. has been altered or whatever. And you kind of see how uh, the way it was written, the Quran is two different times when Islam was weak, they were like, oh yeah, everyone's our friend. And then when it got strong, they were mm. kind of saying, you know, kill everyone. Yeah. And Everyone that doesn't agree with us, we don't need them. Exactly. So, and uh, it goes from Meccan or the earlier re revelation to the later revelation, which is the Medina revelation. When yes. Muhammad was in power, he had an yes. army of 10,000 men mm -hmm. that would do anything for him because he um, openly and um, um, uh, freely gave them women, gave them uh, the booties of war, and they mm -hmm. were having a great time. So why wouldn't they do that? These people mm -hmm. that they had no business, nothing nothing else going on. So, exactly. and then all of a sudden, Allah had a different revelation for him. Mm -hmm. And then gave him this revelation that whoever mocks you, whoever turns away from you, whoever converts from or, or leaves Islam or whoever, whatever, just, just destroy him. And that fear mm -hmm. kept those people around, just like a, a mafia or gang members, God knows. And then yeah. that's the Medina verses, which is, yes. and, and when you read the Quran, because it's not in uh, chronological order. Yes. So you read in chapter two, you said something, you should read, it. for example, here says, oh, uh, the people of the book, they're all happy and, wonderful and then the next uh, chapter says wherever you find them besiege them yes uh, take uh, uh, be in kill. ambush and catch him kill him They're like what just happened should i the law <laughs> yes. in chapter two says law there is no um, um force there is no um force or um what is the word um there's no uh, forcefulness in islam yeah that means in religion force. Yes, you shouldn't force your religion. <laughs> but all of a sudden, this says whoever leaves the religion, kill them. They're an apostate. Yes. That is that, that that is very confusing also for anybody outside of Islam or anybody inside Islam. But yes. we realize that when the Islamic regime took over, there were no Makian verses or there was no early revelation they applied. It was mm -hmm. everything by force. They took over whoever was in opposition. They yes. absolutely destroyed, and then they left Iran with Sharia, which mm -hmm. is your last name, Shariat. Yep. Mm -hmm. They left Islam with Sharia. They ruled Iran with Sharia, mm -hmm. and they told us and they showed us what Islam is when they um, killed killed the young men and um, 
And then before they killed a young woman, they raped them because they didn't want them to go paradise. Supposedly virgins would end up in paradise of Islam. So they would rape him in, in order to make him unholy, to send them to hell. And then they, when the people, uh, when somebody was a thief or, or steal something, they would cut their hand. If somebody wouldn't fast, they would lash him publicly naked 80 times on the streets. And the Iranians and the Persians saw it. They mm -hmm. realized Islam is not peaceful. And, a peaceful religion or a Persian thing. Mm. It just didn't go with the Iranian thing, with the Persian culture. Iranian people were always, um, you know, civilized. They had culture, they had poets, they had so many beautiful things. And all of a sudden, all of this hatred was coming in inside Iran, mm. including the hatred for the Jews and the Christians. It is not an Iranian thing. No, well, actually, as you know, Persia or Iran, uh, helped rebuild Jerusalem in the Old Testament, and of Allah. Of course, King Cyrus yes. did. Yep. And one of the first human rights uh, uh, things were written from Persia, protecting other religions and other beliefs. And mm -hmm. and most Iranians don't know. They think Christianity is a religion of the West, but they don't know it actually was birthed in the Middle East. And Persia was one of the first countries that. Uh, became uh, a lot of people became followers of Christ. We see in the Book of Acts the Parthites, Medes, and Elamites, the first people group that it mentions in the Book of Acts, were all from Persia. Of course, in the Day of Pentecost, the three people group that you just mentioned, the three first people group, they all lived in Persia. There was uh, there were, there were Jews, massive number of Jews that they lived in Iran because they felt safe among Persians, among the Iranians, mm -hmm. and then uh, eventually. When they accepted the Lord in the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came, many of those Persians that they were in Jerusalem receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, receiving Jesus mm. as their Savior, they took it back with themselves to Iran. Yes. I don't know if you know this part of uh, fact, Nachman, that the Chinese people of the old, they called Christianity the Persian religion. Because, because first, yes, the because Christian Persians religion. took the gospel to China. From the Silk Road, they took yes. it all the way to China. Yes. And these are the things that the Iranians today don't know because they, they always thought Islam was a thing of Iran. Mm. For 10 centuries, they have wiped out every little history, every Christian history that we had, every Jewish history that we had. That um, Esther, Mordecai, Daniel, all of their tombs are in Iran. Those people have laid in Iran. Yes. And, and but now, mm -hmm, please. And, and Iranian people don't know that they're they're lied to that Islam is has been that way forever, and that uh, Christianity is an uh, influence of the West. But actually, as you said, Iran was sending out missionaries to China and other places. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a beautiful history that we're going back to it. It, it is you, you're seeing it now. Yes. More than ever, Nagme. Um, your uncle is very involved in the Iranian underground church, and uh, uh, you see all of the stuff that is happening. We see, I believe, in 2004, 5, and 6, we had a massive amount of people that converted from Islam to Christianity. But that number is growing today. It's mm. just, um, it's some, it's it's a, it's a sight to behold. Really. Well, is. yeah. Even in the last year, with the Mahsa Mini killing that. Uh, girl because of her head covering mm -hmm. i've heard so many people from inside of iran say we're done with the religion of islam we don't we don't want we don't want to reform the government we don't want to yep. reform islam we just want to be done with it we just want to get rid of it correct and that is meaning more disillusionment with islam and it's um theocracy it's laws and everything that means there's going to be a big gap that needs to be filled by the gospel of the lord jesus christ and christianity is so much closer to the hearts of the Iranians, to the softness of the Iranian heart, the Persian yes. people. It's, they're so much more yes. comfortable with it, the hospitality yes. and everything that goes with it. I mean, I talked to numerous believers, Iranian believers, that quickly, they have all sort of songs, beautiful songs, mm. that they want to um, worship Jesus with it, with all of that music that comes out of Iran, with all the uh, beautiful things that could turn for the glory of God. So, Nagme, um, I, I have a very important question. Since um, uh, you have been in Iran and then, of course, in Turkey, what do you do now? How's your involvement today as a believer? Well, I still uh, work with the underground church uh, in Iran. Mm -hmm. I 
we have, uh, uh, as you know, Iran has Afghani uh, refugees that have now gone back to Afghanistan. We work mm -hmm. with the underground church in Afghanistan that have left Iran as missionaries. Mm -hmm. uh, I work with some believers in Iraq and we're getting some open doors in Syria. Mm -hmm. I kind of, um, uh, uh, also I've written a book called I Didn't Survive <laughs> that just came out about a month ago. And so awesome. um, mm -hmm. I'm busy with that and speaking tours and things like that, but I'm still involved with the Middle East um, mm -hmm. mission and um, seeing, you know, seeing so much happening there. It's really uh, exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just thinking how the Iranian government is involved in so many countries and terrorism mm -hmm. and it's so amazing that god's using iranian christians to also get into these countries um like afghanistan and iraq okay. and karbala and there's mm -hmm. believers going to all these places uh iranian believers and spreading the gospel in these very hard places that maybe other people can't go absolutely and there we um in the mission world it's called the near cultures so it's mm -hmm. not uh, they don't look very different Mm -hmm. And many of them, because of all the languages that is spoken in Iran, from the Azaris to the Arabs, yes. to the, they're easily integrated in in, the, in those cultures. We have mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm working now with believers that they know three four different languages comfortably they speak, and when yes. we go to any places mm -hmm. as as a mission team to minister. We don't have any cultural barriers. We don't have any yeah. language barriers. They're easily sharing the gospel, and the it's not such a foreign thing. It's not just such a far thing, you know. Uh, exactly. As, you know, let's say a Korean or a, an American come in the Middle East try to share. It's it's they, yeah. they really the Iranians are really easily um, bridging those gaps. And I, I, you know what I've noticed, you know, I grew up in the US, so I didn't know all of this mm -hmm. until I went back. But I noticed that there's a lot of respect, even when I work with um, Iraqi or uh, Syrian or Afghani refugees here, mm -hmm. there's a lot of respect for Persians. So God has given favor mm -hmm. with the Persians in, so a lot, yep. in a lot of those countries. Um, of course, you know, the Iranian government's using that to do very bad stuff, but mm -hmm. the Persians, the Iranians have favor with all of these people. And so God's using that to also take the gospel to these countries Absolutely. in the Middle East. That is awesome. And now may, there's a question that uh, one of our viewers is asking that how could they pray uh, uh, specifically for Iran, what they could pray specifically for Iran? Um. You know, as you know, the Christians are uh, suffer the most. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the ones the government persecutes the most. They're the ones that are usually the poorer because, um, you know, of uh, if 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 they're found out that they're Christians, they are um, denied education and work and all of that. And also now there's a fear of maybe war. I don't know if you've heard that. I hear that from mm -hmm. a lot of the believers that they're afraid of war and the Iranian government getting involved in stuff. And so I I, I would say um, prayer for protection for the believers, provision for the believers, mm -hmm. and also that, um, you know, I hate to say this, but that it would stay pure for the gospel. Sometimes uh, the business style of the mm -hmm. West, I'm sorry mm -hmm. to say this, but the business style of the West can corrupt uh, the church in the Middle East, where um, following Christ means paying a price, means uh, giving everything, and sometimes uh, a lot of the culture of uh, where Christianity can become something to make money off of or uh, thrive is can get into the Middle East and kind of um, hinder the gospel. And so, I would say pray for the purity of the movement yes, to stay absolutely. pure, to stay committed to Christ, to stay pure for Christ, not to be tangled up in uh, Christianity slash the world, that they would continue mm -hmm. to uh, be purified from the world and to be focused on Christ as their focus until um, we, we either mm -hmm. Jesus comes back or we see him face to face. But I would definitely pray for provision, protection, and also purity, that the church would stay pure and focused on Christ. That is wonderful. Thank you, Narma. And um, uh, we have about 300 people watching live right now. And... Uh, as a former Muslim from the country Iran, as a um, as somebody that 
comes to faith in Jesus Christ and um, goes back to Iran, leaves America to go back to Iran to serve the Iranian underground church, what would you tell to the viewers now? We have on five continents, we have viewers, we have people from Africa, we have people in Asia, all, all, all five continents. Every country, if I want to name, it would be a lot of people, a lot of places. But what, what would you have to tell them? Because there's a lot of believers watching. They're very encouraged by, this, by the testimonies of former Muslims. But what, is, what would be your um, um, charge, if you, would, if you call it? Well, I, as, you, as you said, I ended up going back to Iran, and my story doesn't end there. Later on, I got to sit down with Pre uh, President Obama, and I mm -hmm. met with Trump, and I met with heads of governments, and I got to share the gospel. As I prayed as a nine-year-old, Lord, give me the nations. I got to share the gospel in front of the United Nations and all that. I would say keep clinging to Jesus and keep praying. Like The Bible actually tells us to be annoying in prayer. <laughs> like, you know, sometimes when someone keeps asking, you get really like with kids, like you're like, okay, stop, stop. But God actually tells us keep doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say just don't give up in praying. You don't know within a moment, God could bring you before kings and could, you know, God sent me back to Iran at the verge of a revival. And I got to be leading, co-leading that movement and seeing a move of God. And so I would say, keep praying. I prayed that prayer for I don't know, almost 10 years, um, mm -hmm. more than 10 years, 15 years before God uh, sent me to Iran and allowed me to be part of that revival. So I would say, I, I would, I would say, keep praying and keep clinging to Jesus. Um, you don't know when uh, he's going to bring it all together and give you the desire of your heart based on for his glory, for his kingdom. And I just want to compare this. Uh, I, a few years ago, I was watching the kar Karate Kid with my son. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the uh, kid wants to get strong and find the final battle. But what the sensei, the master, teaches this kid is just to clean, you know, uh, you know, just to wipe this way and that way. And, and the kid at the end says, well, you haven't taught me any karate. I'm just learning how to clean, you know, uh, wipe on and wipe off. And mm -hmm. But all those th things that he was doing every day that seemed like worthless was actually preparing him for the final battle. Yeah. So a lot of times in our Christian walk, just the every day repeating, it doesn't seem like we're doing much for the kingdom and we're praying the same prayer. You don't know when that time comes and you learn all these moves that God has been teaching you in, in your quiet to be faithful to God, to keep praying, to keep mm -hmm. trusting is actually making you a vessel that's useful for his kingdom. So I would say, don't give up, just keep praying that's and keep, awesome. keep, keep listening to God, even when it doesn't make any sense. That's wonderful. And then uh, last but not the least, uh, um, can you tell us where we can get your book? Yeah, it's on, you can just search my name, uh, Nagme Panahi, or I didn't survive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's on Amazon, it's on Barnes and Nobles, Target, pretty much a good reads, everything you can, you can just Google it and find it. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Nagme. And, um, we, I really, really appreciate you taking time being here with us and, uh, sharing your wonderful testimony and your walk, walk with Christ. Um, God bless you. you. And, um, hope this is no, not going to be the last time and you come back and I would <laughs> love to, uh, uh, in, uh, interview if your, your brother is open. I would love to interview him uh, yeah. on the channel. That would I be will great. talk to him. Yes, Absolutely. he had the vision. Yes. <laughs> we, we, we love the ex-Muslim testimonies here, the, the people that have converted from Islam to Christianity. This channel is designed for them. Tell mm -hmm. us how you forsook your father's religion. Now, we're open to that, and it's been an, a very, very encouraging platform for a lot of believers all around the world. The world. Praise so God. just Praise um, God. connect them to me. I'm Okay. I'm, I'm here and uh, we have the platform. Thank you so much, folks. Make sure you subscribe and uh, share this with other people.